Humanity's greatest asset is our brain. We have brought about all kinds of clever advancements in all aspects of our lives. And today, even our habitats are being made smarter. Looking ahead, living is about to become intelligent. Have you ever wondered what the future would be like? What life would be like? What would the next big idea be? The new way forward? It's time to ask questions about our future. Explore new ideas. Seek out fresh insights. Join us on Future Forward as we discover what matters in this world of ours. Objects around us are becoming smarter, collecting and using information about us to improve user experience. This is the age of big data. And with the strategic use of big data comes the rise of a smart nation. A smart nation is one where there are many elements uh, of technologies, uh, of ideas and concepts at work. And it has to be one that enhances the life of the city through intelligent ways, uh, through ways that eventually will create efficiencies. And uh, it has to be one that is also very highly connected. So it will take government, private sector, companies, startups, creating ideas, developing those ideas, and it will take citizens and residents to come together to, to make things work. And because we are a city-sized country, we are able to be nimble, to take a concerted, integrated approach to taking a piece of technology, testing it, trialling it and deploying it to help residents to be of value to citizens. Indeed, Singapore's size has meant that things like technology, connectivity and data analysis can easily come together to better the lives of her people. So these are the three outcomes that we wish to pursue under the Smart Nation initiative. The first is quality of life improvements to all citizens. The second is to create economic growth, economic opportunity. And the third is really to build platforms that can help bring people together, bring communities together to share stuff, to co-develop and build things for one another, to crowdsource and so on. And all that could also be the solution to more immediate challenges. Demographics is a big issue. Europe, by and large, are having negative birth rates. In order for economic growth to propel, uh, you really need to have a sound demographic uh, base to start from. It was reported that Japan, there are 125 million today. By year 2100, will only have 60 million inhabitants with the current trajectory. You can imagine the pressure that that would put on healthcare systems, education, etc. It's a revamp of the entire country. Now, I know the Japanese government are addressing this, but I think technology has a huge role to play to combat, uh, you know, the impact of demographics. And technology will play an equally huge role in Singapore, home to a growing population as well. It is no surprise that a big part of the country's smart nation initiatives will focus on healthcare, in particular, geriatric care. We know that Singapore is experiencing an ageing population and it's actually estimated in the year 2020 there will be up to 900,000 uh, number of people above the age of 65. But in terms of healthcare infrastructure, we would have an estimate number of 25,000 number of uh, hospital and nursing home beds. So it's very apparent to us, right, that there is a surging need in geriatric care in the next five years. And eVita Healthcare is helping to meet that need. This is our bed sensor, the first generation. We have dropped this in nursing homes and hospital. We have our EBOS sensor mat is wedged between the mattress and the bed frame. And this EBOS sensor mat will be connected to an EBOS controller whereby it will process the information and trigger alerts to the nurses uh, if the occupant on the bed needs any form of help. So Darius is simulating he's a four-home patient and he can move uh, he can move on the bed, this will not trigger any alert. Let's say the four-room patient is attempting to leave the bed. Our bed sensor is actually detecting the pressure point on the bed. When the patient leaves the bed, it will trigger the alert. And in the future, beds won't just help with falls, but with better patient care. In the long term, the whole idea is that we will deploy uh, smart home sensors and the kind of data that we are interested in gathering um, would be like the patient vital signs plus their um, mobility in the house and this data will be uh, 
fed to the uh, hospital so that the doctors right, can have access to this uh, data. Just imagine a future whereby right, the patient no need to uh, relate what is the medical condition. The doctor can refer to all this historical data to make a more informed uh, uh, diagnostic. In addition to smarter healthcare, Singapore can also expect smarter homes. The Housing and Development Board will introduce the Smart HDB Town Framework by focusing on four main areas, smart planning, smart environment, smart estate, and finally, smart living. Smart planning means taking advantage of computing power to come up with environmental simulations that planners can use to improve the design of a town. So for example, we are going to make use of uh, environmental modelling to look at, for example, the type of wind flows so that we can harness uh, better wind flows and natural ventilation to cool the town. Other things that we will be looking at is where all the hot areas are. So with that, we can landscape certain areas better. We also know where to capture the best energy from the sun for our solar PV for energy generation. The next domain is what we call the smart environment. The smart environment means that we have a network of sensors placed throughout the town. And with these sensors, we're able to monitor many environmental factors, whether it is wind or humidity or temperature. So for example, in one of the pilot projects in Pongo North Shore, we are going to put in what we call smart fans in the public area. The smart fans can be triggered when the sensors pick up certain temperature or humidity. And residents of the upcoming Pungal North Shore HDB town can look forward to having the first taste of living in a smart estate. Smart estate is about using ICT and sensors to help us better manage our estate municipal services. So, for example, uh, we are adopting the pneumatic uh, refuse waste disposal system. This is where you suck rubbish from all your centralised rubbish chutes into one point for collection. You can put in a sensor at the bin chute and monitor the volume of waste that you collect. The moment you reach a certain volume, for example 80%, the rubbish truck can come and collect the waste. This optimises a lot of your resources the rubbish trucks don't have to come every day. Apart from environmentally conscious housing layouts and waste management systems, individuals can also use home management systems to make smart living more green. The last domain is called smart living. It is about making our flats a smart enabled flat. For example, you can have applications that deal with uh, the monitoring of the elderly at home. Another example is the home energy management system. This means that our residents can subscribe to a service whereby they can view how much energy is being consumed in their home and they may know which devices or appliance is using up a lot of energy. This also helps the residents and their family to modify their behaviour and this of course helps our residents to save cost. And it's not only at home where inhabitants of a smart nation can expect improvements in quality of life. After the break, how will data help urban planners design a smarter nation? A smart nation is not just about technology, it's also about data collection and data analysis. With smart technology everywhere, all the data generated can help guide decisions to improve the living environment. If we have access to data, if we have, if we have people being acting as sensors, then that sensor information we can use to have a much better understanding of the complexity of our society and to create situations in which our health is secured, in which our life is secured. And so it will all benefit back to us. One example of how even a mundane piece of data can be used to, to, to create uh, insight and discovery is uh, the example of shoot fires. So SCDF knows when fires happen in the HGB shoots. SCDF gave this data to a group of data scientists in IDA and they do a little bit of analytics on when and where these shoot fires happen and the discovery was that they happen either in January or in February. You can start imagining the kind of uh, better anticipatory service that we can offer in terms of fire prevention. 
uh, maybe there are more discoveries to be found. But how do we get from raw data to actual solutions? So one of the things that you want to do is to develop methods to analyze that data in an, in an, in an advanced way such that you can make models out of that, predictive models. And these predictive models can replay bits and pieces of nature um, and bits and pieces of this collective behavior. And one use of predictive models is in the planning of future transport systems. And MATSIM, a multi-agent transport simulation, is one such software. MATSIM is a simulation software that allows to model and simulate the mobility and activity patterns of millions of people uh, over the course of one day. So what we include is public transport schedules up to the detail of the capacities of individual buses and trains and when and how often they actually run. On the private transport side we have a highly detailed road network which includes information such as capacity, speed, the number of lanes, but obviously in Singapore also the ERP gantries and um, how much they cost at what time. Then we bring together supply and demand in the simulation, which allows us to identify um, overcrowding for trains, how reliable the buses actually are running, and also where congestion occurs. And it doesn't stop there. Matsim will also be able to predict different future scenarios. For example, if you want to predict the impact of uh, the opening of an MRT line, Matsim allows you to predict how many people will take this line, will it uh, alleviate congestion on other lines and get actually people out of their cars and use public transport. There is currently also a big buzz around robotic or autonomous uh, cars, but how many of those cars do we actually need to serve travel demand in Singapore as of today? Will it actually be able to replace mass transit? Over at ASTAR's Institute of High Performance Computing, its transport simulator can help to minimise traffic disruptions. What if there is actually a breakdown in the system? Are there mitigation factors uh, that we can then put in, uh, in place? And uh, is there a way of predicting, for instance, where the crowds are likely to form at different times of the day? Uh, all the mitigating steps can actually be planned beforehand so that we could send buses or taxis straight away to those affected stations and then get the crowd uh, to disperse and then uh, people can go on to their destinations. Another feature of this platform is that you can disrupt this for 10 minutes and then remove this disruption eventually then look at, as a result of this disruption, how will it impact the other stations. And traffic isn't the only thing that researchers can simulate. The National Research Foundation has begun a project to replicate the infrastructure of the whole of Singapore, virtually. So Versus Singapore is a 3D city model um, infrastructure, we call it. So in the physical Singapore, you have buildings, about 200,000 buildings in Singapore. So we can virtualize them in 3D models. For example, you can tell that the dimension of each side, you can also have certain details of the interior, like when you go in a shopping mall, where are the shops, how big are the shops. With this uh, information, uh, it's enriched what analysis can do using uh, those information. The same technology can be used to plan for emergencies that may arise in the future. The top house is new buildings, we have a lot of interior information. Uh, we could use that to do evacuation planning. Uh, you can run a modern simulation called Smart Agent, then you model, uh, if there's an event, uh, you know where's the exit point, you know the number of people in there, uh, and if there's an emergency, how you evacuate the people, and then it can be your center operating procedures uh, in your draw plan. This is something that is uh, very useful for the, uh, the uh, public agencies. Apart from these huge improvements in quality of life, what other perks will come with living in a smart nation? And what are the costs to all of this? We find out after the break. A smart nation will not only improve the quality of life, but also provide more economic opportunities for its residents. Well, when we look at economic growth, one area that we want to pursue is how technology can be used by our SMEs. When you look at in the areas of F&B, can I use technology to allow me to serve more customers with the same amount of human resources? If I look at freight transportation, can I use data science, data analytics to 
be more efficient in bringing goods from one point to another. If I look at uh, retailing, can I use uh, e-commerce? Can I use sales channels on the internet to improve my business to, to reach out to more customers? And to encourage the incorporation and growth of technology in businesses here in Singapore, the Infocom Development Authority has set up IDA Labs, an incubator for tech-based startup companies. And Evita Healthcare is just one of the many startups working with IDA Labs. I believe that a very strategic partnership between uh, private companies and the government would really help a lot in nurturing startup, making things possible for them. Because of the existence of ID Labs, we are able to share resources. It's also a place where many startups can come together, congregate together, and share ideas, share problems, and share solutions. And that's also the third objective of a smart nation, bringing communities together. A smart nation not only creates spaces for constructive interaction, it should also bridge the gap between citizens and communities. The thing that I look forward to in a smart nation is when you can have platforms that allow each of us as individuals to contribute in different ways to society. If you are a developer and you feel that there's a certain social need uh, that can be addressed by an app, you write an app for it. Your intellectual property is your contribution to society. If you are not in the app writing business, uh, you get onto a platform, you contribute data, you contribute your experience, and that adds to, to the society's understanding. And we share information that is helpful to one another, uh, and we come closer as a community because of that. Who will respond when the elderly member falls in a HDB flat? The immediate family should be informed. But what if I also have a system where community can respond to it, where your neighbour can come and ask, are you alright, and so on. So really, you, you begin to see the potential of platforms being able to bring people together to, to, have, uh, to help one another in different ways. A smart nation will certainly change the way we live. But is there a downside? After all, a smart nation depends on data collected from the individuals living in it. Does living in a smart nation mean giving up individual privacy? Privacy is a really important topic. Knowing that you have guarantees and you follow certain standards in which you can preserve the integrity of the data is increasingly important in today's world. But there's a big difference between open data and personalized data. And being able to manage your data classification and identity management is, is a really big responsibility for governance to make sure that they use the data in the right way. It's really important to have non-identifiable data that is being made available in terms of demographics to help drive decision making in a number of different different issues but at the same time uh, respecting the privacy of an individual uh, and make sure that government do not supply uh, private data to outside organizations is really important and given the heightened risk of information leaks there would have to be more security to protect the growing amount of data collected so we work with a number of uh, DPAs, data privacy agencies, to address concerns of privacy issues and make sure that we put that into uh, our methodology of how we handle data. And we are the data broker on the data provider and we have the responsibility to live up to those stringent standards. The government really sees uh, a real need to, to boost our cybersecurity uh, capabilities and that's important for three reasons. The first, we want to protect control systems as we continue to make full use of technology, uh, we want to make sure that, for example, when our street lights become smart, uh, we want to make sure they are protected from, from external attack. The second is we need to guard against identity theft, because as you do more and more things online, as you interact with governments, with companies, with banks online, it is important for the system to know that you are you. And the third really is to protect data, protect personal data, data that you have given to government for a certain purpose. We want to protect that from being stolen, from being leaked for, to, to your detriment. While security needs to be guaranteed, perhaps there is another way of looking at it. We can randomize things um, so we can guarantee that. But of course, if we to kick out all privacy elements, everything, then basically we're not measuring anything anymore. So it's all about incentives. It's all about what do we gain if we share a little bit of our privacy how much quality of life we get in return for that. The amount of work that goes into implementing the many systems involved and the huge amount of information needed would surely come at a high price. In the end, is a smart nation worth the money? Anything that we do, 
the cost must be lower than the benefit. And whatever we do in terms of making the nation smart, in terms of applying uh, new infrastructure and new technologies, we do it with the motivation that when I put this stuff in place, I am making things better. And this is the most cost efficient way of doing this. And the, the investment must always be able to pay for itself, whether in economic terms, in financial terms, or in social terms. But whether a smart nation succeeds or not will depend largely on the involvement of its people. Everyone has a role. For the government, it's about putting in place the enabling infrastructure. It's about um, putting in place the enabling policies, uh, encouraging the use of open data. But government uh, is not, does not have a monopoly on the best ideas, especially in the area of technology, which is moving so fast. So we are really looking to the private sector to come up with those ideas, to come up with the killer apps that really make a difference. And of course, uh, residents and citizens have a role to play in both as fellow innovators, uh, giving feedback to applications, to ideas, but also as uh, users of, of, the, of the technology in terms of being going onto platforms and, and participating as a crowdsourced participant, as a co-developer, uh, looking at different ways of uh, using uh, uh, data and technology. The key point is to remember that as a society progresses, people have to learn how to do things better uh, for themselves. So it's not a question of uh, creating jobs or maintaining jobs for its own sake, but how a society would make use of uh, its best talent, in other words, its people, uh, in the best possible way, looking for the best possible solution that benefits uh, the most number of people. We're learning all the time and, and we're drawing value from technology all the time. From in the internet of things, with sensors, with devices, with smart systems. When you tie them all together, we're going to get smarter and smarter and smarter over time. And with that, we're going to be safer, we're going to save lives, we're going to get better education and we're going to live better lives. Countries all over the world are heading towards becoming smart nations. The benefits are clear, but ultimately it will be the participation of the people that will decide the success of a smart nation.